welcome. Uh, I'm uh, very excited uh, to see a very good turnout for, for our event tonight. Very excited for the second one of our coming conversations. Uh, my name is Adrian Dahl. I'm the director of the Institute. Uh, and I'm extremely pleased to be able to uh, introduce uh, today's uh, panelists and today's panel on, on feminist views on, on sex work. Uh, I'll say a few things in terms of introduction. Uh, I will then uh, mosey off the stage uh, and, uh, and join you in the audience, and I will then be back uh, for Q and A after uh, after at around um, around uh, uh, six uh, o'clock, and then. Uh, you all have ch a chance to uh, ask uh, ask Dan and Melissa questions. Uh, you have here the uh, the uh, URL through which you can submit them. Uh, if uh, uh, questions of access or ability uh, restrict you from using that, uh, we also have very old-fashioned note cards and pens available if you uh, require them. Uh, I'll say a few things about Clayman Conversation and about the Institute first. Uh, uh, the Clayman Institute was founded in 1974 uh, and uh, has uh, been a leader campus-wide in terms of advancing uh, innovative solutions for gender equality. Um, <clears throat> and it uh, has a mission of both uh, promoting and disseminating uh, cutting-edge research uh, both within the university and to a broader public. Uh, the, we do this specifically through uh, uh, research projects that involve undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs, a postdoctoral program, uh, which Melissa is part of, uh, and a dissertation uh, fellowship program, as well as a faculty fellows program. A few uh, members of each of these cohorts are in the room uh, today. <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the new initiatives this year has been these claiming conversations. Uh, this is our second one, uh, and the idea around them has been to bring uh, central but underattended uh, questions of the present moment uh, around gender and sexuality and race uh, to uh, uh, Stanford and to create not so much a, a situation where, um, where we invite two disputants who would disagree on issues, but people who can sort of uh, uh, amplify each other's insights into, uh, into a particular uh, uh, topic. And I think today is, is, is no exception uh, there. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements about uh, tonight's, oh, I should mention that the next one of these is gonna be on April 9th. Uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, that one's going to be called Debate Me, and it's about online debating culture and questions of gender. Uh, we're very excited for that one. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, promises to be uh, quite spirited as well. Um, uh, one other thing about the Claiming Conversation is they are uh, recorded, they're filmed and photographed. So uh, just so that you know that, uh, there was a notice posted somewhere where people tend to not read notices, so I'm going to point that out. Um, in, in terms of uh, today's program, uh, it is a, we were very pr uh, pleased to have uh, uh, Diamond Styles and Melissa Brown here to talk to us about, <clears throat> to lead essentially a, a black feminist conversation about sex work and a trans-inclusive uh, conversation about, about, uh, about the question of sex work. And I'd like all of you to reflect on what this conversation would look like if either of these two or both of these two were not true. Right? What, would a, uh, what, what are the kinds of uh, conversations that are frequently had around this topic, uh, which is to say that I think this, this will, be, uh, will be different. Uh, our hope for tonight from, from the Institute's point of view is quite simply that, uh, that this isn't the kind of conversation you're used to having around this topic. Um, and it's not necessarily, and I should say this also by way of preface, it's not the one that you necessarily feel comfortable having. So if there is a certain amount of discomfort with some, some of these topics, that's OK. But I think that it's an important uh, thing to sort of think through why that's happening. Um, and I, I think that uh, our speakers today are uniquely positioned to shed light on, uh, on how issues of gender, patriarchy, race intersect with questions that 
that uh, you know sort of are very much in the zeitgeist questions of autonomy, consent, uh, and and uh, and white supremacy as well. Uh, in in uh, terms of uh, our our two presenters, uh, they will each. Uh, uh, say a few words in the beginning to sort of get the conversation going and then just have have a conversation which uh, <clears throat> they've been doing already <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll get to sort of eavesdrop in uh, halfway halfway into it so I'm very excited about that I've been privy to oh sorry I've been tri privy to a lot of it uh, and it, it uh, I, I can't wait to hear more um, but briefly I should introduce uh, both of our speakers so Diamond Styles is uh, one of the premier voices of uh, the millennial black trans community. She started her activism at 17 when she won a First Amendment rights lawsuit against the Indianapolis uh, public school system, a victory that allowed her to go to prom in a gender affirming gown instead of his tuxedo. At 19, she was the op first openly trans woman to attend the legendary HBCU Jackson State University where she honed her passion for activism. Currently, uh, Diamond is the executive director of Black Trans Women Incorporated, a national nonprofit that is led by black trans women focused on social advocacy, positive visibility, and building strong leadership among advocates, activists, and allies. Uh, they host an annual empowerment conference with trans-specific programming that draws uh, from the US and beyond. Diamond is also the host and producer of Martha's Plate, a weekly podcast that centers trans-inclusive pro-black feminism and pop culture. And then Melissa Brown is a postdoctoral fellow at the Clayman Institute. Uh, she graduated from the University of Maryland with a PhD in sociology in 2019. And her areas of expertise include intersectionality, digital sociology, social movements, and sexual politics. Melissa's current project uh, centers on how black women exotic dancers based in the urban south use social networking uh, smartphone applications for advertising and for networking. Uh, her data set in this, and this is beyond fascinating to me, <laughs> includes over 31,000 images, videos, and texts generated from the smartphone application Instagram. Uh, the exchange of various audio, uh, uh, sorry, which, which uh, as you all know, uh, can be used uh, for all kinds of things in terms of exchanging messages, exchanging uh, image content, and uh, it turns out doing business. Uh, Melissa basically uses a, a mixed methods analysis to examine how uh, black women exotic dancers perform erotic labor how the landscape of contemporary strip clubs uh, maps onto 20th century Jim Crow segregation, and how the self-definition and self-valuation of the erotic labor of black women contrasts with popular, uh, but with depictions of it in popular culture. She's also the digital editor for Black Feminist Sociology, uh, a forthcoming volume edited by Professor Zakia Luna and Whitney Pertle. So please join me in welcoming Melissa Brown and Diamond Styles. Thank you so much for being here. So you want to start off telling everybody about you know your life story and just how you came to be who you are? Okay. Um, so I think it's interesting to talk about why I'm here mm -hmm. and how um, what led me to this space. Yes. Um, I'm really open about my life and how I experience things. And Melissa is a listener of my podcast, Marsha's Plate, and that's where I share a lot of my stories. And so um, one element of my life is that I used to be a sex worker. Um, but it goes back further than that. Mm -hmm. When I think about sex and negotiation and survival, it all has been, that's in my experience, from my great grandmother all the way unto me, sex has always been something that was negotiable and something that could always bring some sort of income and some sort of um, level, up, uh, another level of survival. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to my, my grandmother, my great grandmother was notorious for upgrading husbands. <laughs> 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 it was a one husband. I, everyone after had a little bit more money than the one before. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very, very clear that how she negotiated was um, she had this privilege. She had light skin mm -hmm. in, the, in the spectrum of colorism. Yeah. She had light skin privilege, so 
all these men suited her, chasing her, and she was in Mississippi, and so uh, it's super deep right, exactly. <laughs> in, that, in that area of the country. And she would say things like, yo, if you can, I have two daughters. If you can't bring something to the table, you're not getting none of this. So either show me what you got or get out of my face. That was, she was, people talked about that as almost like it was an urban legend right. in my family. <laughs> her daughter, later on in life, became a madam. She was the first woman in my life that I knew who lived in a mansion, mm -hmm. who owned a monkey, who went to Australia. She did these things because she had access to, in proximity to, a, a white suitor mm -hmm. who gave her access to her own parlors. In the city of Indianapolis, she owned multiple ones. And so she was a, a woman of status, but she also was a woman of the night. So it was this kind of, she was also this urban myth of but where when I, when I would hear her name, she was my Aunt Rosalind, when I would hear her name from people around um, the neighborhood, she was, it, she was a lady of the night, but she also was respected too. Um, and this went on until my whole life. Later on, when I was born to my mother, my mother was a um, teen, she was a teen mom, and my grandmother, the, one of the respectable women, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. my grandmother was, I would say she was, you know, this, you had this baby, yeah. so you're gonna take care of him, and exactly. I'm not gonna help you at all. That was right. her punishment for you becoming pregnant. Yeah. Um, and my grandmother was the sister of the lady of the night, just so you know, Rosalind. <laughs> my grandmother was the good girl. She went to yeah, college, she exactly. went to da da da, but Rosalind was the lady of night. So under, there's only, there are only two sisters in this family. Mm -hmm. So my, my mother, being that she became a teen, she became a teen mom. The, the punishment was, you can't go anywhere, you gotta take care of this baby, I'm not gonna help you, I'm not gonna give you any money, I'm not gonna do anything because you decided to get pregnant, so blah, 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 blah. So my mother went and got an apartment, but she was super, super struggling with a baby. Mm -hmm. She didn't have any resources, she had a job, but things were not coming in. Knock, 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 knock. Here comes my Aunt Rosalind. She was like, girl, <laughs> You got a baby now, you a grown woman. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how to get this money. And she says, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna make it easy for you because I've been in this business. <laughs> I already have a client for you. Mm -hmm. So you ain't gotta give me nothing because this is just me helping you out. Boom, she hooked my mother up with who I come to know as Uncle GB. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was an older gentleman. And I knew when he came around, he always had money for me. And she, ever since she was 17, he's been in her life. When we needed him, he would come. Mm -hmm. And and so and when I was younger, I didn't know the nature of their relationship because I was a child. Right. But as I got older and I started to see things and put things together, I learned that this was a negotiation. Yeah. This was a this was sex work. Mm -hmm. um, as a trans woman, I come up and I have my grandmother's mentality. Interesting. These, as a, as a young trans girl, come, I transitioned when I was 12. As a young trans girl, there was a type of woman that I wanted to be. I wanted to be the good girl. I wanted to be the motherly one. I wanted to be the pure, <laughs> nice. I wanted right. to be my grandmother's type of, type of girl because that, yeah. I knew for some, instinctively that that was the type of girl that got the privileges. That was the type of girl that everybody liked and treated well. Yeah. Because when you were a lady of the night or you were the whole type, mm -hmm. they didn't treat you well. Mm -hmm. And so the type, of the type of woman that I wanted to be, I wanted to mimic that. And so when you're young and you're staying with your parents, there's no responsibility. Mm -hmm. But when you get older <laughs> and you have a homophobic mother who, you know, get caught up in the prison industrial complex and then she goes to prison and you have to take care of your brothers and all that kind of stuff. For me, I was put into life really, really fast. And yeah. as an adult, as a trans person, there's no handouts. So I was in a situation where I had custody of my brother. I was working 
and I was fired from a job because I was trans. Mm -hmm. Got another job, fired from it because I was trans. And I'm like, here in California, I, you have protections where you can sue and do all that kind of stuff. I lived in Indianapolis. We didn't have those right. protections. So there was literally no legal discourse for me to be able to do anything about um, course of action, right. for me to do anything about it. So I had a friend, just like my aunt came and introduced it to my mother, I had a friend who said, girl, <laughs> let's put you up an ad mm -hmm. and, you know, start working because nobody is going to give you a handout. Right. And so I was in a situation where I, I, you know, I started it to survive because I, I couldn't get a job. Each job I would get, I would get fired. My name wasn't changed yet. Mm -hmm. um, I was still early in my transition, so I was a little bit passable, but maybe a little bit not. You never know. <laughs> right. And so sometimes, it, I, some, I, I can't say that I, it was, oh my God, I wanted to do this. Actually, I had a resistance to it, a resistance yeah. to it. But it got, I had to survive. Mm -hmm. But then it changed. It changed to, um, it went from this is survival to this is, um, oh, this is fun. This is giving me access to the amount of money that I had never seen before. I was 21 um, and the amount of money that I was making was crazy. I had never seen this. I'm used to making $8 at Wendy's at the, you know, from, or my um, work study money when I was in school. Right. Um, so I wasn't, I, I, I'm, I'm just shopping, I'm buying bags, I'm buying Louboutins, I'm buying, <laughs> I'm paying rent, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm paying, buying my brother's school clothes, I'm, I'm able to afford anything that I want, trips, I'm, surgeries, I'm, I'm able to do all of these things because right. I've got access to this money. And so then it turns into, um, I'm enjoying this, this is fun. And there was a self-esteem thing that was happening. Okay. So everybody prior to this was telling me, you, you, you're not going to be an attractive woman. Your hands are too big. Your feet are too big. You're not attractive. Mm -hmm. you, and this is their way of telling me not to transition. Yeah, exactly. But they're just, the world is discouraging me. From my family to outside of the world, calling me names and violent situations on the bus and throughout life and stuff like that. So the world is telling me you are unattractive, you're not going to be an attractive woman, you're not beautiful, you're not pretty, you're not any of these things. But in this situation where clients are spending their hard earned money to see me and my body how it is, <laughs> in that space, it kind of gave me a self-esteem. Yeah. It gave me a sense of, well, hmm, maybe I do look nice. And so that became um, actually a gateway for me to actually um, appreciate my body, appreciate my looks, appreciate who, um, you know, who I was becoming through the process. Yeah. And so then it turned into now I'm just being lazy <laughs> because now I'm not in survivor mode. Mm -hmm. I have investments, I have done things, and I've set myself up to where I really could stop this, but uh, do I want to go work for somebody else? Yeah. <laughs> do I want to not be able to make my own hours? Do I right. want to not be able to um, take trips when I want to? This is a lifestyle that I have come accustomed to that I enjoy. And then I got tired of that, and then I went back to school and started something um, a little bit different. I became a YouTuber and started a podcast and start, just started doing things a little bit different. And then I got out of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but I transitioned, I, I wanted to explain that because throughout my life, sex work has been something that um, for the black women I know, yeah. It was always something that they negotiated, yeah. whether it be small little negotiations, how I flirt with somebody, um, mm -hmm. how, I, um, how I pay for school, how I pay for books. Right. I knew tons of strippers. I knew tons of people who maybe they didn't want to strip, but they got into webcamming at the time. Right. So they didn't do the full on, I'm with a guy, but you know, I'll get on. Um, night flirt and <laughs> different phone line and chat lines right. so to make my money to survive um, there used to be a site called phone actress and you <laughs> and she and my friend would um, 
throughout our, we would be hanging out at her house and she would take, call, take calls oh, in the middle of us hanging out. <laughs> so and she's just role playing. So we're oh, in the okay. background <laughs> laughing and she's, yes, this is, you I remember Girl Six. <laughs> the movie that Girl Six. That is so funny. Um, uh, and so it, it, all the time it, it has always been, even to the crackhead that we knew up mm -hmm. the street, where she was no, she, no, negotiating her addiction in sex. It was always, exactly. um, it was always something that was possible. So I think that's, and because I'm open about what I've experienced, I think that's why I'm here. And, yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I thought about, at the time that I was asked to do this, like it was literally a conversation in the hallway, Adrian was like, oh, do you want to talk about your research? And I was like, sure, cool. Um, and so then I started to realize as people approach me about it, like, I know why I'm interested in sex work, but I'm really surprised by who I draw to me uh, when I express that because you don't know who else is interested in sex work. Um, and so for me, I got down to this research trajectory because as a young black woman in the South, uh, Growing up during the time of our particular discourse in popular culture around young black women in the South, uh, attaching our desirability to the strip club, um, I was, a lot of that was projected onto me from the time I was a small child. So I remember it was my first week of middle school and I remember there was a tension around that particular school because prior to that we were like status divided. So like we had this magnet program where all the kids who were really were just upper middle class kids went to for elementary school. And then the middle school integrated us not only by class status, but also race status. So I remember like the students having this divide about like, oh, we're coming in. They called them resident kids, but resident just needed working class kids whose neighborhood this actually is before we colonized their school building with our magnet program. Um, and so I remember it was the first week of school, uh, gym class was like the only class that we had with resident kids. Uh, and so this girl, the resident girl looks at me and she goes, she's a hoe and just walks off. And so I was like 12 or 13 years old and I thought to myself like, I'm literally just standing here like, <laughs> why did she say that to me? Uh, but it didn't stop, right? And so that was, my interest in puberty was about uh, people in this space, in this space is the culture of the Atlanta Strip Club is mainstreaming, policing my body by calling me a hoe for no reason. Uh, and so it was my senior year of college where I finally was like, I am tired of people calling me a hoe. Like, you get it from every direction. You get it from your friends. You get it from your family. You get it from strangers. Like, the, I have not been paid for nothing out here, and yet I get keep being called a hoe. So I just so happened to be reading Patricia O'Collins' um, Black Feminist Thought at the same time. And there's a chapter in there about controlling images and how the discourse around black women's sexuality is rooted in these controlling images uh, that kind of justify our ideologies of race, our ideologies of sexuality, our ideologies of labor. Uh, and so that was a moment for me where I separated away from the way that I was managing this a front of being labeled a hoe uh, through kind of being like your grandma's good girl, right? Like that was originally the path that I had chosen for myself. Um, but through learning black feminist thought, I realized like, you know, there's no reason to uphold these dichotomies and doing these dichotomies does a lot of labor around justifying really oppressive systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started to learn like, well, what does it mean to be a black woman in the United States, right? And it was around the time of like Rachel Dolezal and like people was trying to act like they didn't know who was black anymore. <laughs> um, so I was like, how do we know who's black in the United States? And I started to look up the history of black women. So reading people like Deborah Gay White, um, reading um, Paula Giddings, reading uh, Tara W. Hunter and the ways that uh, the legal system in the United States codified black womanhood, right? So it first started, a lot of people think that in the United States, like uh, Africans who first came here were immediately enslaved, but that's not true. We were actually African indentured servants, just like everybody was brought to the United States who owed someone a debt, did some type of indentured servitude. Um, but then what ends up happening, right? You have the English and the Africans 
having sex with each other. These biracial kids are popping up. And suddenly, England's like, oh, we have to protect our sovereignty uh, over this space, over these sexual relations and the way that they create the population of you know, what, I guess, is our colonial project at the time. So by the time the first African woman's child was an adult and had their child, black people were slaves. Uh, and that looked like the first law um, in the 1600s, the Tithable Persons Law. And so it's this idea that it was the early income tax, basically. Um, so that law said men, house, men heads of households, um, all men who'd work on the land, and black women, right? But the thing was, there was some ambiguity in the language because at that early time, the English conflated their identity with Christians. So the law would literally say Christian, but they meant English. But we didn't know they meant English until black women and black men started getting baptized and then going to the court and saying, I'm Christian, so I can't be uh, in this servitude anymore. And so the court said, OK, just so we're clear, <laughs> all black people are tithable persons. Uh, and then through more legislation, they remove away the tithable person des de designation by uh, designating different statuses based on who the mother of the child was. So if you had a black mother, you're, you were born into slavery. Whereas if you had a white mother uh, and she had a white partner, you were free. If you had a white mother and she had a black partner, you were uh, sentenced to 31 years of slavery. Uh, indentured servitude, mm -hmm. right? So once again, we have the birth of like mulatto as a class, a differentiating uh, factor that we call colorism, right? Uh, so this is the basis of black womanhood in the United States. And I think that when we look at ourselves in our post-civil rights moment, we kind of like to focus on the ways that we're, we've overcome certain aspects, but there is a long history between the 1600s and today. And if you follow the trajectory of black women, you can kind of surface the ways the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so Diamond had just brought up when we were uh, talking earlier about after slavery, we have reconstruction, right? And so in reconstruction, we tend to focus on sharecropping uh, as labor, but that was a gendered form of labor, except uh, a lot of unmarried women who were physically able and capable would do uh, the labor as well, right? And that's another category that uh, I'll get to when I'm wrapping up about the way that wife becomes a category and a status that is protected on the backs of unmarried women who might need to turn to sex work in order to pay their bills. Uh, so with these categories sorting out women, uh, black women end up being once again, codified but masculinized at the same time. So even though theoretically women aren't supposed to work, the laws were actually that black women had to work. Right. So even though as they normalize this idea that there's a two-parent household and the woman stays at home, legally black women would go to prison if they weren't working outside of their houses. And so black women weren't able to invest in their children in the same way uh, that white women during that time period. They weren't able to um, start businesses themselves the way a lot of white women were. They always had to be working uh, to kind of be, and one of the things I like to say is the ways that black people were the technology uh, for white people prior to uh, the machines that we use now, right? So there's that commercial that comes up for the Super Bowl uh, where, where Portia de Rossi and Ellen are talking as they're going out the door and Ellen goes, oh, I, what, I wonder what uh, people used to do before Alexa. And then they do like this time machine scenario where like servants and all this stuff. And I'm like, this is not okay. Like, it's not like we know that it used to be human bodies who used to do this. But to so brazenly um, put those things in parallels, like once again, we have to unpack that discourse of the reason why we stopped being technology in that way is because we started demanding getting paid. Uh, but for unmarried black women specifically, the pathways to getting paid couldn't possibly look like the way married black women could, the way that white women could because laws were being instituted to segregate us out of spaces. Uh, there were times when, as white women would enter the workforce, 
when black women wanted to integrate that type of labor, white women would hold uh, work stoppages. They would boycott and they would refuse uh, to work in the same spaces as black women. So as the white, I mean, so as women collectively are entering this workforce, uh, that segregation becomes materialized into these racialized and gendered forms of labor. So specifically for black women, that looks like doing domestic work, right? And that maps on pretty neatly to the expectations of what black women were supposed to do for slavery. So you can imagine then, uh, black women looking to make their own way would think to themselves, I'm not going to do this. There's more agency in being, um, so we have the Roaring Twenties with the dance halls, the burlesque dancers and stuff. Uh, and this is happening as black women are m migrating out of the South, putting behind them the domestic work, the uh, sharecropping work, and moving into the North, into the Midwest. Uh, and so that is when these spaces that we typically don't like to talk about as being racist start to institute racist policies uh, to curb the mobility of unmarried black women. Uh, specifically, this blues woman was this fear not only of the white middle class, but also the black middle class of this fear of the unmarried working class black woman who, uh, for white people, it was she might have you know mixed race babies. Uh, for black people, it was she might convince our daughters to join her and do her type of work. Uh, and so this is the ways that racial segregation was normalized as black people were put in proximity to vice districts through racial segregation. And then you get to police the vice districts because it's a vice. Uh, so you're doing dual work of policing sex workers and uh, black neighborhoods and black spaces. And so who gets implicated the most? And that black women sex workers who, as white women get to enter into professions, but also maintain a type of sex work that's not as visible. Uh, black women didn't have access to these spaces. They were legally excluded from them. So they had to do things like street walking, which it's much easier for law enforcement to uh, police you when you're in public versus if, say, you have a madam who owns a brothel and who can kind of perform respectability that because white women were allowed to secure like, you know, their own homes or their own housing, uh, they were able to create spaces for sex work that black women didn't have access to. And then they couldn't even have it because even in spaces where sex work was legalized, uh, race uh, mixing was not legalized. So in New Orleans, which had never really outlawed sex work, they did outlaw racial mixing in brothels, right? <laughs> so um, as we're going through the 20th century, right, uh, black women kind of get access now to more spaces, especially thanks to Civil Rights Act and things of that effect. Uh, but then there becomes this class division, intra-racial class division among black women uh, that I think is implicated in the way that they raise their daughters, their black daughters, uh, and the pathways that your mother wants you to go on uh, as she uh, teaches you her ways. So for me, I was raised in the evangelical church I was also raised by Jamaican immigrants. Uh, so there was like a type of respectability around me that was imposed on me by my parents and the church that looked a lot different by the way that men projected their desires onto me, right? So it's like, if I'm supposed to be this church girl and this school girl, then why is it that men won't stop asking me you know, to perform sexual acts for them for money? Like, what, what is that about? And you, you should arrive at the conclusion that there is no respectability, right? There is no logical reason to continue to uh, keep those divisions of women. But there is a lot of social capital, a lot of privilege that I think that women who aren't sex workers get from uh, participating in the ways that they dichotomize themselves and separate themselves as distinct. And so one of the goals for me, as I look from a black woman, a black feminist perspective, as I talk about the trajectory of how we get black womanhood today, we can arrive at how in the 21st century, black women strippers are extremely popular, except that actually black women strippers are extremely <laughs> popular. So what does that mean? It means that a black or a white woman Kim Kardashian can adopt the features uh, that were prized and valued through black cultural practices uh, and then through her association with a black man, with black men in rap, which is another popular discourse around black women's sexuality, she can literally adopt the features for her own profit, having never lived the uh, culture that leads her to do that, right? So what does that mean? 
For me, as a black girl raised in Atlanta, I remember we would be in class and we would be like about ready to take a test and we'd be like, you know, if we fail this test, at least we can go down to Blue Flame, right? Because we're actually raised in this culture where that is an alternative. You turn on the radio uh, every Friday night, they're advertising amateur night, right? Uh, down at the strip club. Um, people suggest to you, like, what are you doing studying? You should be a stripper. Um, and so you live in the culture where it's flattened, where there is no space between being a sex worker and being a black woman because of the culture around you. Um, but people who aren't in that environment, aren't raised in the environment, have access to the visuals through social media and deforce it from its context. So that looks like black girls were the ones who introduced twerking to YouTube, uh, according to Kyra Gaunt, but uh, white girls, specifically Miley Cyrus, are the people who wear, when I say twerking, most white people know what it is now <laughs> because of Miley Cyrus, right? And furthermore, the history of twerking being police being penalized was because it was a racialized practice that was sexualized because it was divorced from the context. Whereas uh, if you look at the history of black movement, black dance, it's rooted in African cultural practices. And there's a way that we kind of um, participate in this erasure of our Africanness as black people in order to assimilate into whiteness, right? And what we're doing when we assimilate into whiteness is adopting certain types of discourses. Specifically, I would argue anti-LGBTQ discourses and anti-sex work discourses that function together to normalize the marginalization of all types of people. Um, so my work really is about using the ways that sex workers self-represent to challenge the way we think about labor, the way we think about sex, the way we think about not even sex workers, but women who aren't sex workers, and the ways that our practices map on uh, in different environments, map on to the types of tensions that you see and observe uh, when you study sex work. So yeah, that's my tidbit. Um, so I guess I don't really have questions for you per se, but I think what I would like you to talk about is um, you and your podcast members. Uh, so she does Marsha's Plate with Zahir uh, and uh, Mia. Um, and you guys have chosen to be really per transparent about your experiences. And I think that I would like for you to share about that and share about um, even the goal of that, because I think coming from research, I feel like scholars have really neglected the realities in favor of a very mono narrative around what it means to do sex work and why. Hmm. So I think one of the reasons why we want, uh, we want to share it is because it's authentic. And I think people mm -hmm. relate to things that are authentic. Yeah. And we're honest about it because that we know that there are some people who are in the business who are navigating those spaces in the moment that they're listening to our podcast. True. Or um, there are people who are out of the business who don't understand it, who don't know why a trans woman, the, the, the dynamics of our lives that would lead us into um, those situations. Yeah. So um, voluntarily or involuntarily. Right. So um, forced or, you know, sometimes in, in, the, in the nuances and the differences in um, a cisgender woman's experience in sex work and right. a trans woman's experience in sex work. We also have a trans man on our, on our show, Zaire is a trans man, and how he navigates sex work right. and his manhood. Yeah. And how, um, how uh, the difference in how the pressure and <laughs> for a trans woman is almost like, <laughs> and for him, the, it's, it's different. It's yeah. just totally different because he's going into a place of privilege as he's going oh, into his manhood. Oh, okay. You Interesting. See what I'm saying? And yeah. so he has access to um, a different type of work as a man right. that he didn't have access to um, when it comes to like labor work, especially in Houston, Texas, where there are like barges and um, oil mm, rigs. Okay. And he has access to a certain level of um, work that we don't have access to. Right. Um, and you know, just different nuances like that in our experience and in sharing it. And we're learning at the same time yeah, true. in the moment of us, of us talking about it. And I think being authentic and sharing those experiences really yeah. take um, somebody's education about the trans experience to another level. And so that's why we talk about it 
you know, so openly in, in, in as much detail as we, um, as we do. Right. Um, and because we have a, we have um, skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Like we, we have, there's, I don't know when I'm going to get fired again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just, it's always, I've been fired three times in my life and it changed the tra trajectory of my life each and every time. That's a valid Like yeah. I was just kind of, I don't know when that's going to happen again. Right. I like to think that because I have secured my spot um, in the business ventures that I have had, yeah. that it might not be as, um, mm, you know, impactful if, right. if it does happen. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm always, not gonna always be a sex worker, but I'm gonna always be invested in uplifting them. That's true. And, and because I never know when I'm gonna go back. <laughs> yeah, and I think like what you're hitting at is kind of why sex work mattered to me was this sense that as our economy gets more precarious, um, I've noticed that with digital technology, sex work has like slowly creeped in in spaces where mm -hmm. it's hard to tell. Like part of why I wanted to study Instagram was because I was like, okay, I'm raised in Atlanta and that's a stripper, <laughs> but on the contents of Instagram, maybe not, right? And so it was just interesting the ways that like Instagram specifically became this space where um, women were really relying on sex work to do their labor. So my example is uh, the way that I codify the types of erotic labor that black women do, black women exotic dancers do on Instagram, a lot of it maps onto what black women fitness models do on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, so like one of the things that they do is black women exotic dancers uh, twerk in their videos. Um, yeah. And it makes sense because the expectation for consumers of black women exotic dancers is that they conform to that rap cultural imagery. Yeah. Um, and so they, they, they have, like you said, skin in the game and like doing that practice digitally. It's like, I can't figure out why black women fitness models are twer twerking um, other than it's the same type of return on their investment, right? Like yes, there absolutely. is, and so, but they get a different type of um, pass. Like I even think about say, pole dancer versus pole fitness. I've seen stories about women saying that being exotic dancers, which is where the concept comes from, once their pole instructors or a studio owner finds out that they used to be a dancer, will fire them. Even though it's like we wouldn't have pole fitness <laughs> without dance. exotic dance. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I mean about the ways that like it's interesting that as the way that's kind of practices that we ascribe to sex workers are getting normalized, we're also same, simultaneously penalizing the very women who we got these practices from. And I think there's a way that women are kind of uh, implicated in the way we take on roles and the way we um, project them in order to protect ourselves and distinguish ourselves from others. But you were talking about earlier the ways that like these roles are, And think you about know? how that manifests through history. Like you just yeah. kind of laid out the history. I, uh, no matter, we, if we talk about decriminalization, legalization, yeah. or criminalization, no matter which one you choose or which, um, you know, train of thought that you're in, mm -hmm. it's still going to be working in a capitalistic framework. Yeah. So it's still going to be a, a, a capitalistic market. So yeah. cap capitalism is oppressive no matter what. So right. whether either one, and it's going to, and how how we do it, no matter how far we are into the oppression, like if it's yeah. the Reconstruction era, the 20s, or now, mm -hmm. it's going to manifest in various different types of ways. So yeah. now that we have the technology, that's why we see OnlyFans, and you see exactly. people with Cash App in their mm -hmm. um, profile. Right. Uh, the, all that, those things come from strippers, like they yes. come from sex workers, come from you know, all these things that we are seeing in the mainstream of how you market yourself, how you hustle yourself, how you get attention. Exactly. Uh, sex workers and exotic dancers have been doing those yeah. things to get attention and to get numbers. Look, when we think about T.S. Madison, right. she legitimized herself, quote unquote legitimized, 
um, <laughs> herself through a video on where Vine. on Vine, yeah, exactly, you know, to twenty-two inches, right? It, you see what I'm saying? So she, she had she knew how to because of her sex worker past. Sure, she knew how to market yeah. and knew how to use this utility. And then now you see everybody trying to do exactly. not exactly the same thing, right? But trying to use it in a way right. that. You know, that a sex worker taught you how to do that. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and not even necessarily, like, you're not, like, in on the knowledge that you learned mm -hmm. it from a sex worker. Um, mm -hmm. So I think about, I think there's a slow way that we're starting to, as technology develops, the faster that we get um, to the appropriation or the co-optation between, like, you know, a sex worker doing it and someone adopting it, the clearer it gets. And I think about what you just said about putting your cash app <laughs> reminded me of when I was in, once again, I think middle school was just a strange space. Uh, and so it would be your birthday. And so usually the girls, yeah. So the girls would get money and then you'd pin it to your shirt. And then all of a sudden, randomly, the school administration was like shutting it down. Prostitutes do that. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, mm -hmm. how do we know? Like, how do you know that that's a thing that prostitutes do? Like, mm -hmm. and furthermore, like, well, how did it get to us? Because we're doing it just because you see your friends do it and people legitimately give you money. Like if someone sees a, a, a dollar on your shirt, they too want to give you a dollar because they want to be part of like your, your collections of dollars. Yeah, because it's your birthday. Um, and so same way of like the cash app kind of being ubiquitous everywhere, right? Like I find it interesting how on Twitter, for example, people will drop their cash app because they went viral, but that's not labor, right? Like I actually do the labor in making you viral by using the features to retweet and such to put mm -hmm. you out there. You should be paying me. <laughs> but because we capitalize off of vis visibility in our mm -hmm. society, people feel like being visible is the work and it's enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's kind of about the ways that like aesthetic isn't really valued in our society, or let me rephrase that. <laughs> aesthetic is undervalued in our society um, in our rhetoric, right? But my argument is that if women lo left Instagram, Instagram would die. <laughs> like yeah. if women, women said, we're not gonna do this Instagram thing anymore, that whole ecosystem would fall apart because it really does exist generally for people, all stripes, to go on Instagram and um, view beautiful women and like what beautiful women are doing. And not even the concept of sex work. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Adrian talks about how uh, looking at gardening on uh, Instagram, you notice a lot of the gardeners have their shirts off. <laughs> like, you know, um, say, like, yeah, the fitness models type thing. Like, I just don't remember women fitness models being this super sexualized in the 90s, or it was a different type of performance of sexuality. And I think that's what, what happens is that a type of performance of sexuality that we penalize uh, historically now is getting adopted when a woman can say she's in a certain type of category, right? And if she has that category, she can kind of um, subsume her sex worker status too, or just deny that she's adjacent to sex work in any way. Um, so you talked about earlier with, uh, in our earlier conversation about how a lot of white women sex workers are also doing something else. Yeah, so um, they'll say, they'll say to make them more, to make whoever the ears that their narrative is laying on, they'll say, oh, I am, um, uh, I'm in sex work because I'm paying for school. Mm -hmm. Like I'm also a student. So somebody listening to me be like, okay, well, you're, you're trying to do something better. Yeah. You're not just stuck. So what that does, it just separates and gives you, you are, you're just, you're trying to, you're this one that's, that's trying to do better. Yeah. And then there's one over here who just is, even though this is her agency and this is her body, and she might just want to do it because I want to do it. I like this work. Right. <laughs> you're separating those, um, they have the privilege to separate the type of sex worker that you are. Yeah. Because if you're stuck in, if you're the girl that, why would you want to be a sex worker? Mm -hmm. Why? It's somebody, you see what I'm saying? Somebody um, judging that particular person. Whereas she knows that if she says, I'm in school too, yeah. that there's a level of empathy that she can get right. in that regards. And I don't exactly. think that other people who don't have access to school, who don't have access to these upper, um, not upper, um, to these respectable yeah. um, things, 
if I don't have access to go to school, but I'm still a sex worker, now you don't have empathy for me. Mm -hmm. You don't have sympathy for my situation. You don't, um, if I choose to do this, if right. I choose, re and it's not about survival. I like to have sex. I like to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. I like to control my hours. I like to do all of these things. If I'm that person who has that kind of agency over my body, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Like, what is, what is wrong with it? And why do I need to be doing something else that you deem legitimate and right. you deem respectable before you actually um, sympathize with my cause? Yeah. And so we, so I know when I, was, when I was in the business, nobody gave me that kind of um, sympathy. Right. It was always, oh, well, that's, you're a trans woman. That's what you do. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I think that is so, it's really valid to say that because I think about the discourses around sex work um, from, like I said, these various institutions uh, I remember, I think it was Angelica Ross, who uh -huh. was in the, um, uh, Caitlyn Jenner had like a series, um, yes. I cannot remember, I Lifetime or something like that, yeah, and I think it was Angelica Ross who was formerly a lawyer, um, somebody was, somebody was uh, a black trans woman who's formerly a lawyer mm -hmm. uh, in the series and talked about how they turned to sex work because of the slippery slope out of once I'm trans, like when I was a black man or presumed black gay man, um, I was able to move in the space of being a lawyer because I'm still masculine, I'm still perceived as man, but as soon as I transitioned, uh, I was fired, and then I tried to do jobs, and job after jobs kept firing me, and sex work was the only space where you don't get fired, mm -hmm. you know? And to have the status privilege of having a whole professional degree and losing it off of how you choose to identify, yeah. um, and I think that, um, the discourse around sex work doesn't actually engage people who actually did it. Uh, it more so engages like what we perceive or presume about these people. Um, and I think that academia has typically functioned to support and bolster the discourses that say the church upholds. Um, and I think about the ways that um, I can't remember which black feminist scholar, I'm pretty sure it's Patricia Collins said the patriarchal family unit is the basis of all, you know, institutional relations in our society, right? Yeah, and it, it, start, it, it started, the founding fathers of this country, yes. they were running from Catholicism in Europe. Yep. And so when they came over here, they said, this is gonna be the utopia. And yeah. the utopia of here is white. Yes. It is heterosexual. Right. And it is Christian. Yeah. And so this is the the family unit was the core exactly. of what they want. So if you out if you are the white family unit was the core. So if you're outside of that, mm -hmm. we're gonna demonize you, we're gonna create laws exactly. to fight against you. We're yeah. going to anything. That's that's why Salem Witch Tribes happened. Exactly. Because these women didn't fit the norm. Yeah. That's why um, you know, it's so many things, so many um yeah. things that happen and, and laws that were created just to police the gay men, yeah. um, police black folks, police right. women. If you did not try to conform into this family foundation, mm -hmm. then, you know, yeah. it's not what it is. Exactly, and I think like the, even the, the attempt to police like suggests the reality of the situation, right? So there's a lot of denialism and like anti-sex work rhetoric about say, um, there's this like this perceived oh, you had other options, right? Um, but then also it's like, but what does it matter? Like, if I did right. have other options, why are you mad I chose this one? Right. Um, and I think that the way these discourses kind of function to, like you said, police everybody who's not part of this unit is so that way we can continue to have this unit to be the dominating uh, social force in our society. Um, and so I think about, say, like, once again, growing up in Atlanta, uh, there's two Atlantas, right? Uh, so there's that <laughs> white Atlanta and the black Atlanta, but a lot of the ways that um, that even came to be was as these strip clubs are arising, uh, white communities are creating legislation to make sure that strip clubs can't be zoned in their neighborhoods. And so the, the strip clubs don't disappear, they just get placed in black neighborhoods. And specifically in Atlanta, because of the suburban sprawl, um, the highway infrastructure being part of our actual demographic boundaries. So like when you're driving on down on 285, and it took me forever to realize this, even though I live in Atlanta, once you hit Memorial Drive, the demographics change. And you go immediately from 
being a black neighborhood to being in white neighborhood and white spaces. Um, and so every type of strip club pretty much in Atlanta is south of um, 285 and east of 285 or sorry, west of 285, right? <laughs> and so when you look into the history of these spaces, you find out North Druid Hills, where Emory University is, uh, used to be a planned white community. Like it was literally des designated a whites only residential mm -hmm. area. And so even though it's the 21st century, uh, we don't have redlining anymore technically, we don't have um, racial covenants anymore and things like that. It doesn't matter because we're, it's literally in the ground. We have laid the groundwork for these uh, spatial segregation and we can just continue to practice it. So right. even though Atlanta needs the strip club because that is where the black rap urban culture is produced that is now a multi you know billion dollar global industry right. so and what it is i think i guess you guys probably don't know this but like uh so in atlanta when a local rapper makes a song he goes to the strip club and if the girls like the song he can go to the radio because a lot of the djs in the strip club are also the radio djs and then you guys hear them later like when they're the migos and you know all these types of gucci man all these uh, famous rappers but it was a black stripper who approved of the song before it became <laughs> um, a mainstream you know billion dollar industry and yet the same dancers who whose validation is required to create this pop culture are being policed and zoned out pushed out through gentrification and nobody's really invested in protecting that space right so it's like what will hip-hop sound like when the black strip club is gone and do we even want to be in that space? Uh, and possibly the answers could be yes, because part of erasing the black strip club is also coinciding with co-opting co co that aesthetic simultaneously uh, and projecting it onto white women and slowly but surely they become the embodiment of what is desirable again on the backs of uh, the labor that these women performed. And then when you erase the strip club, you then erase the the origin of how it even happened and then 50 years from now no one even remembers why things are the way they are absolutely you know and that that's the normal narrative for anything that we contribute to yeah. society right um positive negative whatever however you want to do it that's the normal narrative like if, even when we talk about you know civil rights yeah you know um black particularly black women particularly black queer women we you know, we're always policing away, and we already we, we're always in the foundation of the movement yeah. happening. Right. And then, as it get further and further and further, we erase out of it totally. It's so true. That's kind of just normal. Yeah, and you saying that makes me think about like what has happened with intersectionality, mm -hmm. like um, <laughs> it originating with the Kambahi River Collective, which is Black lesbian feminist. Uh, and the way that it kind of just becomes this thing, like Ted Cruz tweeted intersectionality uh, two days ago. And of course, like he, the way that he did it was like a, kind of like a dog whistle, right? Of like, oh, intersectionality is going to, uh, you know, essentially lead to the description of the United States. And it's so interesting because it's like, then the critique becomes the problem uh, instead of the problem itself. And classic yeah Republican right -wing <laughs> yeah and this rhetoric then um becomes normalized once again right so it's like i think about like well what does it mean to adopt intersectionality or publicize intersectionality right. especially as a black feminist when you know people who don't get it are already deciding like you're the enemy because right. you endorse it uh and at the same time there's people who claim to endorse it but still want to remove you right so earlier this week there was a uh, a feminist studies professor who wrote a piece about Elizabeth Warren is the intersectional uh, president. Uh, and it's like, once again, like, how did we end up here? Like, how did we end up in this space where black lesbian feminists theorize an anti capitalist framework? And then the woman who said, I'm a capitalist and I'm always going to be a capitalist gets called intersectional. Like, you know, how do we, uh, how do we? continue to, I guess, live from the, the, the positionality of being black feminists and doing theory from lived experience, right. only for it to be completely co-opted out of our hands and uh, what detriment that leads to. Mm. Are we good on time? Okay, good. 
Yeah. Do you think that investing our time in um, decriminalizing, of course, it's going to um, save a lot of people. It's going to reduce, yeah. um, you know, spread of STDs. It's going to reduce um, trafficking. We know what the statistics say. Yeah. But in regards to that, that patriarchal cloud over it, do you think that it's going to affect that? Because I, mm -hmm. I don't. I think that right. it, um, if we don't put laws in to place that still, that criminalizes the exploitation. Exactly. Um, not the work, but the exploitation. Right. I don't think that it's going to um, kind of put a dent in that. Do you think so? Uh, I, I definitely agree with your logic. And it makes me think about the ways that with two types of prohibition, so the alcohol prohibition and marijuana mm -hmm. prohibition being our most recent. And so with alcohol prohibition, when they prohibited it, people didn't stop drinking alcohol. They just made moonshine uh, or they went to speakeasy. Um, and so then, of course, the government realizes, like, well, this prohibition thing isn't working. Let's legalize it. But they didn't just legalize it. They also corporatized it. And so by creating this legislation to legitimize the spaces of doing, uh, producing alcohol, then only certain types of people can have access to it, right? right. So now Budweiser can sell alcohol. The liquor store can sell alcohol. The local bar can sell alcohol, provided that they get these licenses uh, mm -hmm. and all these things. But the people who still know how to make their own alcohol back at home, now we get criminalized uh, if we do those things, right? So I think about, say, my grandparents being um, just out of slavery in Jamaica, uh, or not my grandparents, but my great grandparents being just out of slavery in Jamaica, and how that led to this space where uh, you have these skill sets, but because these people are now coming in saying like, okay, yeah, you're free, but all those things that you did to take care of yourself or provide for yourself are now illegal, and you can only do those things if you go through the transaction of some type of separate uh, business owner to do those things. Right. It's like that kind of creates the impoverishment too, right? Because now I can no longer profit from a thing that I know how to do. So the same thing happened with marijuana, right? It's like suddenly it's pretty legal everywhere. You go to California, like there are literal stores that you can go purchase these things um, and not only purchase like the, uh, the actual plant itself, but purchase like lotion and like it's just everywhere. I was thrown off the first time I went into CVS and saw a CBD lotion. I was like, this is crazy. Uh, <laughs> but but it's, it's a strong contrast from the, the prohibition of marijuana that led to hyper-policing of black communities, the carceral state, mass incarceration. Um, and so now what's gonna become illegal in that space is it's still gonna be illegal to sell it outside of the context of a store. So we're not actually legalizing it, we're just legalizing it in a corporate manner so certain people can profit. I do think that that's exactly what's gonna happen with sex work, because if you look at, say, the context of the strip club, it's legalized sex work, but being that a strip club is a building, a brick and mortar space, it becomes a business in the sense that uh, legal frameworks recognize business anyway. Uh, so now it gets taxed, uh, and not only does it get taxed, but now you go from being self-employed to being an independent contractor. And really that just means that the liability of the labor that you do for the club is shifted onto you right. instead of them taking That's responsibility right. for you if you were an employer. So just like two weeks ago, a young lady, and I want to say Florida, uh, broke her neck um, doing a trick on a pole. Uh, and the club told her, oh, well, you're an independent contractor, so you have to cover your own bills. <laughs> Um, even though literally nobody would be in that club if she weren't on that pole uh -huh. doing that trick. This club is literally structured around the labor of these dancers. And then very nefarious illegal practices happen there. So I learned that dancers have to do this thing called tip out, um, where they are expected to give back some of their money after having performed to the club. That's illegal in a lot of places. You're not supposed to be taxed on your wages in the way that they go about it. But because of, say, the discourse around who we even expose to information to protect mm -hmm. yourself from the, these workplace violations, uh, a lot of dancers don't even know that that's happening to right. them. Um, and so I think that 
if the strip club is like iconic of the ways that our society is going to legalize various types of sex work, then no, the exploitation is just going to be embedded because it's still going to be the same women turning to it who don't have that network of people who can say, hey, no, like that's not supposed to be happening here. Like that's not, um, you're legally protected against that type of violation now that you live and work in an actual workplace as far as the law concerns it. Exactly. So. And it's set up to, it's like a cycle when we talk yeah. about immigrant women. Yes. When we talk about trans women, when we talk about um, poor women, mm -hmm. when we talk about them, it's like a cycle that we all are in. Like, it, it, and I think it, 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 that's just, <laughs> for me, I think when we talk about skin in the game, yeah. I feel like though, because we know that all, well, I hope we all know that all oppression is connected it is important for us to be in collaboration with each exactly. other in yeah. order to dismantle these systems so right. we can all see what is going on in each other's lives. And mm -hmm. I know that, you know, sex work can be competitive <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of um, people in with their hands in the bag. Sure. But I think that the only way that we can uh, maneuver and get around and dismantle it is together because exactly. there's no way that we should be able to, um, you know, I can't be in solidarity with um, immigrant sex workers. True. I, there's no way that I shouldn't because because there's something about my experience that you can learn from. Exactly. And there's yeah. something in, in because there's a level of privilege in uh, a trans woman experience because I don't know I know some but it's very very few that get into sex work through a male. That's valid, yeah. And then there's a lot of sex workers who are cis women that get in it through um, a boyfriend's, you know, emotionally manipulating them into sex work. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't seen that with a trans woman. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen that there's a certain level right. of privilege that happens. And so how to be more independent, how to be more independent, how to be, um, you know, the strategies, um, I can, for me, I just feel like it's, it's, uh, it's super, super imperative that we come together and see what we can do to um, work together to dismantle the system. Because yes. if, if they're going to continue to exploit, they're right. going to continue to do stuff like that you're talking about in strip, strip club. Exactly. Um, you know, so I, I think they're going to continue to do it because that capitalism is going to capitalize. <laughs> yes, so, exactly. And so that's what's going to happen. Like it's no matter, <laughs> like I said, no matter what mindset that you have about it, it's going to, that's, it's going to maneuver in a way, exactly. it's the system is set up to maneuver in a way to exploit the people Absolutely. that are on the bottom. No I agree. What. You're so right. Okay, I think it's time for questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. First up, thank you so much for an amazing conversation. And there's so much, uh, so much here. Uh, I, I, and I love especially the, the, the way you just ended it in terms of well, yeah, ended that was for really now, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which clearly the way labor as such is policed in a society mm -hmm. is extremely sort of shot through with sex, like what you're allowed to do only for pleasure, mm -hmm. only for pleasure, right? And what you're allowed to make work, yeah. what necessarily must be work and what, what isn't. And at the same time, I sort of thought, um, on the one hand, this kind of denying of, of adjacency, right? I think yeah. is how you put it, um, right? That like it looks like this thing, but it is infinitely removed from it, right? It cannot possibly be the same thing. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> how could you? How dare you say? <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, it's really kind of interesting, given this, this, um, given uh, the the uh, the sort of historic moment where we find ourselves, where this is sort of true of labor in general, and I guess exactly. this is what what was sort of something started um, ringing for me when you brought up this move from pro prohibition to corporatization. Right. Could it be that, right, the, the same thing that's true for the woman in the strip club in Florida is true for an Uber driver too, and I believe. Absolutely. That's the same um, That's exactly what I wanted to are we, say. Are yeah. we getting to a point where is Instagram, is Instagram already the corporatization mm. of of sex work, right? Are we, you know, are we already there, where the, yeah. where basically it's already set up the way that exactly uh, uh, that 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 the um, uh, that that uh, right? It's it's made sure that the people themselves engaging in the activity will not be the ones to profit from it. Exactly. 
Is that, would you, you would, you would, or would it's you say it's more gray? It's always been like that, no, though. Right. It's, it's just how it's able to manifest is going to be different. When we talk about Nellie Jackson in Natchez, Mississippi, she's like a legendary madam mm -hmm. who had a house, um, who had a whole house. Yeah. And so there's a documentary about oh, yeah, her life and, right, and, right. and her experience. Yeah. And literally, like, in order for her to keep the house and get the prestige that she had and protection that she had, she had to use capitalistic strategies right. mm -hmm. in right. order to, um, it, even if it exploited her girls. Right. Now she tried to do the best that she can to not exploit right. her girls, but you know, I, this is, the, she had to exploit her girls sometimes in order to keep her house and keep her status within this protected area of yeah. the city. And so when we talk about, um, um, Lucy Henderson, that's a, a black trans woman um, who is who is one of the women who um, started the marriage, um, the equality thing to where to where oh, right. it, she people don't give her the credit, but <laughs> it was back in the 30s and she was went to court in order to prove that uh, I'm a woman and I married my husband because they tried to invalidate it. But yeah. her her life, she ran a brothel. She had. Um, she had connections within the government of the city to where she was protected and she had a restaurant. She entertained people come into the city. It was a part of her using capitalist strategy in the 30s. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. It, it's mm -hmm. it's going to manifest in a, in a different way right. mm -hmm. as, we, um, as we progress in our culture, but it's always going to reinvent itself in another way. So this, in this era, right. it's using technology, Instagram, right. Twitter, and that. Right. It's just going to happen. Yeah, and I think like because the f it's going to keep happening, we also have to think about, well, when it's happening, what's happening to the rest of us? Because I think like people just right. think sex work is a very isolated space that if you're not actually doing it, it's not related to you. But the ways that sex work has been used to either normalize other practices, um, I think, parallels that. So when you talk about brothel owners, um, one of the laws that ended up following that was, in, especially like in the Northeast, that it's illegal for like more than two women to live together at the same right. time so as to prevent uh, women from owning brothels. And yeah. now to this day, the, you can go Google stories and at least once a year, some woman's getting kicked out her home um, on the basis of that law that hasn't actually been taken off the books. Yeah. But on the flip side, we have to think about, well, in absence of those types of regulations, like, well, what are people doing when they're not regulating or choosing to regulate a certain way? And so I talk about how uh, R. Kelly was able to get away with hoarding a bunch of women in his household because in Georgia, it is not illegal to hoard a bunch of black girls in your house. It was literally what people did. They brought African slaves and hoarded a bunch of black girls <laughs> right. on their land. So you can't be shot in that space when that happens because we didn't even have an infrastructure set up and designed to protect um, these black girls. Mm. And that lack of infrastructure does get normalized for all of us. Um, the equivalent of tick out, tip out for gig workers when Instacart was taking right. out pay out of tips. They said, oh, you got, pay, you got tipped $8, so we're giving you eight less dollars. That is a tip out. The only reason why Instacart thinks they can do that is because people have been doing that to sex work. <laughs> Ready. We just weren't concerned about it because we don't feel like we have to do sex work. But a lot of us feel like we have to do Instacart sometimes, right? right? Like mm -hmm. we've normalized that type of precarious situation through non-sex work. So yes, the same exploitation is going to happen to us even if we're not performing sex work because we've right. already accepted it on the backs of sex workers. Right. That's interesting. I, um, so I'm going to get to a couple of questions that were submitted. Uh, one one uh, question that comes up a lot here, I'm sort of scanning over your, your uh, submissions and thank you, um, is, is about uh, the, this kind of ambiguity or tension between um, uh, uh, upholding the sort of the legitimacy and the, and the, the value in talking about uh, sex work and sort of these non-judgmental terms, but at the same time, uh, uh, worrying about how exactly it positions black women's bodies, uh, mm -hmm. especially vis-a-vis -vis a, 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 a white male gaze. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the questions here brings up the question of pornography as well, right? They, they're they're, they're uh, designed to cater to a certain kind of gaze. Mm -hmm. um, how do you square 
you know, everything we've been talking about with, with that? Is, that? is that something that just it's a tension one has to let sit? Or is there something yeah. you can sort of say to resolve that to some extent? Ooh, uh, well, I certainly don't think you can resolve it, but I think that, you know, just like there's a white male gaze, there's a black female gaze. And the black female gaze can be embodied in the sex worker who uh, is using her gaze to recognize that when this white male gaze lands on me, I can exploit something out of it because I'm already being exploited. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we kind of normalize uh, uh, dis trying to divorce sexuality from ourselves as a means to protect ourselves from that white male gaze, mm -hmm. but that's not successful. All you do is end up having to do a different type of sex work. Now you're doing the sex work where you act like you don't have a sexuality, uh, and that <laughs> is labor too. Uh, right. So I think that um, I think about, say for me, I. <laughs> I had never known that this was a thing until I went on social media and called myself Black Feminist MB. Then all of a sudden, these white men who apparently are searching for a black woman dominatrix uh, start flocking to me. And like they have these really weird names and they all say like, you know, like white man looking for black queen or you know, thing <laughs> like that. Uh, never knew that this was a practice and not engaging in the practice, but still off of my interests. Uh, looping these people in. And so once again, it's like the gaze is there, right? So it's like, I'm not gonna stop talking about black feminism uh, because some white man wants me to do, you know, some type of inversion of our actual dynamic through sexual play, uh, which is what uh, that's about. And I think people kind of have to get comfortable with that too, right? It's like, there are people who play with the dynamics of inequality through sex work and that that's a practice that is happening should have us reflect back on the ways that like we kind of um, assume when we say things like white male gaze that we're covering everything. But when you use the phrase white male gaze, that doesn't really quite square away with the black woman sex worker who is purposely pursuing um, this type of clientele as a profit for herself because if the white male gaze theory is to hold, then we're supposed to be doing everything in our power to shy away from it. And that's just not possible because it's not like we walked onto those slave ships, right? They literally <laughs> took us and enslaved us, captured us and dragged us here. And so now we're here in that overarching system um, and we can't stop being sexual because it's happening to us. We can't stop trying to uh, have ownership over our labor because it's happening to us. We have to keep doing it. We have to be creative about the ways we're going to push back against that. And that doesn't always look like, you know, negating our sexualities. And you, in, to me, what it makes me think about is how we don't nuance um, black women's experience enough. Yeah. Um, when we talk about slavery, we, it's always about, um, you know, the forced sexual objectification, right. rape, blah, 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 blah. That when you go from that to where we are now, there is a lot of nuanced stuff that could happen. Yeah. There was a lot of agency that could happen in the middle of that stage. Maybe they didn't have agency right in the beginning, mm -hmm. but from that to now, there's a certain power that can come mm -hmm. with um, where you can make choices to exploit the lust of somebody who is objectifying you. Yeah. And so the power, we're, we're, we're in transition. We mm -hmm. don't have, because we are socially on the bottom of the totem pole, we don't have all of the power, mm -hmm. but we are in transition out of that. And so what we're seeing now is somebody who can be a dominatrix and say, yo, I see you want me to do this race play. Yeah. I need your money. Exactly. So let me, let me show you how to kiss the feet of this black guy. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so the, the, we're com coming into that power just doesn't look, um, it does, it's shocking sometimes when people see that. Mm -hmm. It's shocking and um, I, think, I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's, I think, um, we just got to nuance it a little bit more. Yeah. It's not always um, the depictions that we see Agreed. in regards to that, that gaze. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Um, another question that sort of a couple of these sort of fall into it is the question of intimacy, oh, right? So um, it's obviously a category that we've been problematizing to mm -hmm. some extent, right? We're saying that, um, that, that to sort of distinguish really crudely between, oh, this is an intimate relationship and this is a transactional one, is, is that's not right. 
at the same time, it seems like we all do want to sort of hold on to a notion of intimate relationships. And I think uh, there are two or three questions here that sort of ask the question of, of how one nuances that distinction then, mm -hmm. right? How, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is sex work always opposed to intimacy? Is intimacy always a different ball game, let's say, than, than, uh, than sex work? Or uh, is there a kind of, are, are these kind of uh, um, uh, run into each other, right? How, uh, someone asks here, how do you navigate these two sort of spheres simultaneously? How does one do that? It can be difficult. It can, it can be, it depends on the personality um, of a, the particular sex worker. Like I remember, I've been in various situations. I've been a sex worker while I was in a relationship. Um, I've, been a, I've been a sex worker while I was dating. And it, 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 learning how to compartmentalize that um, is a skill that mm -hmm. everybody doesn't have and some people have it down pat. And and even your relationship with your clientele is different. So there's some people where it's just extremely transactional. It is not intimate at all, even mm -hmm. though it's physical, it's not intimate at all. But then you have, um, because every client is different, you're gonna run into somebody who is your type. Mm -hmm. You're gonna run into somebody who has the personality that, um, you know, that you like, and it might, it might get a little bit more intimate than Joe Smo over here. <laughs> but you know, it's how you navigate that. It's definitely different than a relationship, um, a typical, stereotypical relationship. Um, and how you navigate it is going to be different based on your personality. I'm good at compartmentalizing. I'm good at saying, hey, this is this and this is that. Mm -hmm. But there are those little moments where I'll meet. Um, I, I, uh, I have somebody now who come, that is my friend from my escort days. And so, um, I don't have any, no other client that's my friend, but he is my friend because while we were in business together, he would do things that would step up to the plate in ways that even my friends were not doing. Mm -hmm. And so my birthday come around and he'll just throw me some money to, for me to enjoy my trip to Jamaica yeah. without any exchange for sex because we had, we had a relationship that um, just grew into a friendship based on our conversations. We would sit and talk before we even got to the nitty gritty. We would sit and talk for two hours sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not paying attention to the clock when I normally would be paying attention to the clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be, it's, it, but he had, um, we just had a chemistry together. So, and now we're friends. We don't mm -hmm. engage in that, but we, we are friends now. I don't have any other client that's like that, but him particularly, it just was a different level of intimacy mm -hmm. that just kind of creeped in. It wasn't not, it definitely didn't happen in the beginning, but over time of us um, enjoying each other's company, <laughs> right. it grew into an actual friendship. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how or how it happened, but it literally is just a slow happening. It's not, um, it, I just, I think it varies from each individual person, how intimate you get, how, how much you allow somebody to come in. It's mm -hmm. just different. Mm. for every individual. Yeah, and I think that kind of those questions to me make me think about the ways that like women in particular who aren't sex workers perceive there to be some type of dichotomy and so intimacy lives in the space of the wife and the girlfriend and so the sex worker gets none of that. Uh, and that's not really true. Like through my research, it's just like, wow, you know, men are paying women to essentially be their wives and yet wives are sitting home begging men <laughs> to give them money the same man um, and it's like i don't think that wives or girlfriends who um, align themselves with a man through that type of particular relation uh, recognize the ways that the uh, dynamics of cisgender cis heterosexual partnerships are pretty much sex work like the level of transaction that is uh, embedded in these relationships is something that I think we normalize by calling it romance. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that can lead to a circumstance in which when you look at the data, like women partnered with men as wives um, really struggle in the 
sphere of their sexualities, right? There's an orgasm gap for straight married women. Um, there is uh, the second shift for straight married women where they're doing all this labor for this person. And it's like, you, you have to think about if you weren't here, it's not like this man wouldn't do these things. He would just pay a woman to do it because we have a gendered society. You can pay a woman to cook your food. You can pay a woman to clean your house. Like you can pay women to do all this feminized labor anyway. And yet you're here in this partnership because you have the category of wife kind of accepting less than you'd probably get if you were a sex worker who'd name your terms, right? And so for me, it's like in the sphere of intimacy, it can be transactional. Like mm -hmm. women are really good at intimacy. They are so good at it. Like it is a skill that they really undervalue in their relations with men. And that's what I mean by like being careful about how we try to separate ourselves out from women yeah. sex workers because we have a lot to learn about if you are doing that type of labor sexual physical whatever raising these men's kids like get something out of that like it yeah. is okay for you to be getting something out of that and and not feel like you're teetering into the sphere of sex work and if you do that's okay too like it is okay to take agency over your uh, partnerships with men, especially if they are tied up in sexuality. There is no need to uh, separate out these two things because we're smart. Like we can figure out when somebody's actually our friend versus just, you know, using us. And yeah. I think that that ideal of I'm in this partnership and we have romance, it's all love, really leads women to accept less because they don't want to be called a gold digger, they don't want to be called a hoe, they don't want to be uh, labeled all these pejoratives for being a woman who demands things for their time when they're giving it to a man. Right. I, I feel really stupid not having uh, insisted that we do this on Valentine's Day. This has been an amazing <laughs> coda for Valentine's yeah. Day. Uh, just like everyone scattering off to their dates uh, right afterwards. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, damn you, Clayman Institute. Um, so a, a final question. <clears throat> this is a long one, but I think it's a really interesting one. And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because it's quite long. But this is a, a comment that's, that's asking about um, um, with the normalization of sex as a means for economic gain, especially given the realities of economic inequality. So that on the one hand, this looks like society, um, you know, on the one hand, this, this does seem like a socially subversive um, uh, narrative, uh, says this questioner. But at the same time, it is, of course, a deeply capitalist one, the idea that mm -hmm. women should sell their beauty on Instagram, on TV, on the runway, right. in, the, in the club. Uh, in order to economically advance, right? So uh, it, it becomes, uh, this, this question you're asking, when it comes to the normative evaluation that we can have about the discourse of sex, uh, sexual work selling one's beauty, how should we understand that discourse since subversion of oppression seems to confer, continue affirming that oppression? Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess the question of capitalism, what we're sort of saying, yeah. you know, this is a way to sort of go along with it. Um, does that reaffirm it? Does that, I think that's the, that's the way probably to, to paraphrase this question. I think that's a, that is a really, really central one, right? Uh, it's, it's hard to um, argue that, um, you know, Instagram is still getting rich uh, off, yeah. off all the shirtless people doing gardening. Uh, um, I would say that it's, I wouldn't agree that it was a normalization because it's the status quo. Like that's always what it is. I think actually what's getting normalized is women being vocal about their end of the transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we think about the specific history of the sex work in the United States, there was a time when there wasn't much legislation around it because uh, the, you know, the men were at war. They were fighting each other. Uh, in the Civil War, then the Civil War ended, then they started fighting World Wars, and the World War ended, and we entered this long era of peace. And this long era of peace coincides with uh, criminalizing sex work because now the men that were soldiers that we wanted to have access to sex work or to keep them in the field, we want to keep them at home so they can uphold capitalism at home. Uh, and one of the ways to keep them at home is to make sure that they don't have any other sexual options as opposed to, once again, this patriarchal family unit. Um, and so I think that when we ask about are we, when we when we allow ourselves to profit off of our sexualities, if we're 
also perpetuating the capitalist machine. It's like, are we the capitalists um, or are we the worker? Because if we're the worker, the answer is we're just working with what we got. We have the conditions, especially since these conditions weren't always what they were. They were specifically structured uh, to uphold the goals of the state specifically the United States, as it went from being a group of colonies to a state, and they had to legitimize their citizenship through what? Patriarchal family. You, you produce all our Americans. Uh, you know, you can't have Americans if our soldier is impregnating a woman overseas and staying there instead of coming home, right? Uh, so I think that said, we have to be careful about um, kind of focusing the lens in the wrong direction. Like, it's not the sex worker who created this scenario, it was right. the men. The men came with the demand, the proposition, right? So, like I said, I'm just minding my own business on social media and some white guy's like, hey, do you want to, right. you know, step on my head? Like, <laughs> it's like, what? Um, and so I'm not creating that circumstance, I'm responding to it. Yeah, and I, mean, I think like that's what yeah, that's you kind of have to keep in mind when you uh, ask those types of questions. And, and it it's, reminds me of kind of like code switching and assimilation. Yeah. And there was a time when if you didn't do those things, you wouldn't have access. Right. If you didn't do those things, um, you wouldn't get the job. If you didn't straighten your hair, you wouldn't have access to anything. Um, you, you, yeah. you, you had to do this kind of assimilation or play the game in order to have resources to, to do other things. Mm -hmm. And over time, it came, now we have a natural hair movement. Exactly. We have a, you know, over time, it gets to the point where we have a little bit more agency and um, power in what we can do. And I think eventually, hmm, if, if you know, I, eventually, while we're playing the game, mm -hmm. we're going to get to the point where we can dismantle part of the system. Exactly. You yeah, know, sure. it's, it's going to... Um, it's gonna happen in the same kind of ways that I think that it's happening now in regards to race. This is just in regards to dismantling um, patriarchy. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for an amazing conversation. Thank I you. Thank you all for uh, sticking with us yes. and uh, for, for great questions. There's an amazing one that just popped in. Unfortunately, we don't have time for it. Come up and ask it. Uh, I think it's a very good one. Uh, you know who you are, but it's super long. Uh, but thank you all. And, uh, and uh, thank you again to Melissa and Diamond. Thank you.